up until I started looking into this and reading books like The Wisdom of Psychopaths, I used to just think psychopath equals serial killer, serial rapist, violent criminal underworld gang member, you know, like Tuco Salamanca or whatever from Breaking Bad. I mean, you're just thinking of those kinds of people. But then when you start to look into it and you realize it's the local guy who buys up all the gas stations. It's some guy in private equity who buys companies, fires everyone, and then raises the stock price. It's some guy who works in finance who's just trading and doesn't see the people, doesn't care about the people behind the company. Then you're like, oh, once you broaden your definition to, is to somebody who's not just murdering people at truck stops with a hatchet, you realize that there's a lot more psychopaths out there than you probably realized. And I think, you know, the number one culprit for that kind of uh, belief uh, or kind of misapprehension is the media. Um, and I think that, you know, when most people hear the word psychopath, um, they're going to think of, you know, people like Ted Bundy, um, you know, your, your, your serial killers, uh, both on, you know, the silver screen and, and in real life, Hannibal Lecter, Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, all these kinds of people. Um, but actually what I did in The Wisdom of Psychopaths was I said, look, you know, <laughs> yes, yeah, true. Actually, some psychopaths are people like Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but actually, when psychologists like myself talk about psychopaths, we're in fact referring to a particular kind of personality with a specific set of, of personality characteristics. Now, those characteristics are stuff like uh, ruthlessness, fearlessness, mental toughness, uh, self-confidence, um, coolness under pressure, emotional detachment, lack of conscience, lack of empathy, those kinds of things. Now, if you really think about it, Jordan, and, and that's what I try to get people to do, none of those characteristics that I've just outlined is necessarily a problem in itself, in isolation. All of them uh, in the right context and kind of dialed up at the right levels can actually prove pretty useful. And the key here is the context and the level. And so I think, you know, if we imagine a kind of a, uh, and this was my central metaphor that I've always used, a mixing desk uh, model of uh, the psychopathic personality on which those qualities, um, you know, comprise the, the hodgepodge of knobs and sliders, I suppose. Um, well, you, you, you kind of arrive at two conclusions. The first, as I just said, is that there's no one size fits all objectively correct setting in which those dials might be positioned. It's exactly like mixing a soundtrack in a studio. It all depends on the particular set of circumstances you might find yourself in uh, or, or, or timing, something like that. Uh, and the second, and this is where it started to get really interesting, is that uh, there exist certain jobs or professions out there, right, um, which demand that some of those dials that I've just talked about uh, be turned up a little bit higher than average, uh, demand what I called rather controversially some precision engineered psychopathy. So uh, the, the typical examples that I usually give is imagine that you've got um, uh, the medical smarts to be a top surgeon, but that you lack the ability to emotionally disengage from the person you're operating on. Um, right. You know, you're not you're not going to you're, you're not going to be a great surgeon. Um, I was in contact with um, a, a, a top trauma consultant actually recently. Um, and they were saying, you know what, in, 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 he kind of disagreed with that slightly. And he said, you know, in surgery, actually, once the person's anesthetized, it's pretty easy to get on with the job. Um, a and &E consultants do say that. Uh, but I say, you know, if you're working in, in a and &E on a busy Saturday night in the middle of a major city, you've got to go from one extreme case to another. Uh, you might have to, you know, tell the parents of a child that's been run over and hit and run that their child has died. Uh, and then you've got to move straight on from that to saving the life of someone else. You've got to be able to compartmentalize to the max. And he was saying, that, you know, it's not just in surgery uh, that you need the ability to be dispassionate. Actually, in, in all kinds of medicine, well, not all kinds of medicine, but in a and &E and trauma, for example, you need that ability to compartmentalize, be, to be dispassionate as well, to focus and get on with the job and shut the emotion out, as it were. Um, so medicine is one example. Imagine you've got the the legal smarts to be a top lawyer, top attorney, but but you lack that kind of pathological 
narcissism, I suppose, to be the center of attention in the middle of a high profile case. Again, you're not going to you're not going to be a great lawyer or, or, you know, and of course, famously in business, if you know, if you, you you could have all the Harvard MBAs under the sun. But, you know, if you lack the ability to take a calculated risk or to fire someone when they're underperforming or the, um, you know, the sheer balls to go for it uh, when you have to, again, you know, no matter how bright you are. You're not going to make it in business. So, you know, it's true. When people hear the word psychopath, they instantly think of Hannibal Lecter. They think of the sharp end. Uh, and I always kind of kind of joked, Ted Bundy is the unacceptable face of psychopathy. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, um, as you as you were saying at, at, right at the start. But but actually, yeah, okay, psychopaths are Ted Bundy and Jeffrey Dahmer, but they are also, um, you know, some of your top surgeons, some of your top lawyers, some of your top... Um, business people, uh, and we need these people in society. Uh, also, uh, special forces as well. Uh, uh, you know, I've done a lot of work with special forces. That makes sense. It's interesting because you'll meet, I mean, I meet cross sections of these kinds of guys, these special forces guys, all the time, and some of them are really nice. They're very patriotic. That's one of the reasons they're doing this. And then you could, you definitely meet the other type where they're like, they weren't really well liked by other people in the teams. They weren't really promotable and they don't seem to care about anything. They're the ones who go and like, they try to write as many books as they can and they take credit for shooting Osama bin Laden, even though there's no real, you know, and it's just like, that's the guy who's the narcissistic psychopath who also had the talent to get into and the drive to get into the teams. But you, you talk to people sort of off the record, get a couple whiskeys in them. And they're like, everyone hated this guy. They hated him. He was a terrible person. I've heard it so many times. And, you know, it's the same. Go back to surgery, right? You know, uh, you can get the nicest surgeon you could possibly meet. You can, they want a nice guy. You know, typically surgeons, especially consultant surgeons, are renowned for being a little bit arrogant, being a little bit narcissistic. But they might come across, they've got excellent self-presentation skills. They might come across as being, you know, just really, really nice, you know. But what you've got to remember is in order to even qualify as a surgeon, you've got to get a lot of time in the operating theatre, um, learning your craft. And the ability, I mean, this is a very fundamental level of, of training, the ability to get into the operating theatre, to get that time, you've got to elbow other people out of the way. You know, if you don't, if you're not assertive and say, hey, this is my time, I want to go in there and get that training because I want to be a surgeon, you're not going to be a surgeon. So, you know, the very fact that someone is a surgeon shows you that actually in a formative level of their training, that you know, they're, they're no shrinking violet. They're going to go out there and they're going to they're going to ride over other people to get that opportunity over other people. Now, going back to special forces, I mean, look, it comes as absolutely no surprise to anyone uh, who's worked with special forces that uh, these guys, um, you know, might not be the kind of guy you'd want to go out for a Sunday lunch with uh, a lot of the time. But hey, you know, if, um, you know, a building was taken over by Al Qaeda or something like that, I know who I'd send in to get you out. Um, one special forces guy who I'd work with, always remember, um, who uh, fought the uh, the Taliban in in the cave complexes of northern Afghanistan? Went in there with um, uh, night vision goggles and knives uh, to fight the Taliban. Because of course, if you start firing guns in cave complexes, the whole thing comes uh, crashing down. So you can't do that. So you're almost going back to the Boer War. You're going back to you know trench warfare with knives. Um, you know, you've been camped out in the mountains of northern Afghanistan for weeks on end. You then make your way to the cave complex. In you go with your night vision goggles, knife fighting the Taliban in their very own backyard. Um, this guy, special force, British special force guy said, you know, well, uh, in typically understated uh, fashion, uh, that's not every soldier's cup of tea. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you've <laughs> and these guys live for this kind of stuff. They train for this kind of stuff. This is the kind of you know, living on the edge stuff that these guys, these guys train for. Great quote by the famous British writer George Orwell, good men sleep soundly in their beds at night because rough men stand ready to do violence on their behalf. It's a very unpalatable sentiment, but um, uh, unfortunately, some people might say happens to be true. Another special forces guy I worked with uh, once said, sometimes you got to fight dirty to clean up. Uh, it's a it's a great phrase and one that happens to be to be true. What is the difference? I know I've asked this before, probably even to you, but it's still the difference always eludes me uh, when I try to remember. What is the difference between a sociopath and a psychopath? Is there or is it just semantic stuff that doesn't matter? 
Well, um, I don't think you've asked me that one before, Maybe uh, Jordan. A few few people have, and it's a great question to get out of the way. Um, you know, when journalists um, use the word psychopath and sociopath, sociopath tends to be more an American phrase. It's used more in the American media than the UK media. Uh, but generally speaking, both sides of the Atlantic, when uh, journalists use uh, the term sociopath and psychopath, they tend to use them interchangeably. Uh, but there is actually a technical difference if we're looking at it from the scientific uh, point of view. And that is that sociopaths tend to be more volatile, emotionally labile. They tend to react rather than respond. They tend to be impulsive. Um, this is sociopaths? Ha- yeah, these are sociopaths. Okay. Uh, so, for example, the example I often give is imagine that you and I met in a bar um, and um, you kind of knocked into me and knocked my beer over me or something like that, and I happened to see uh, $100 in your wallet in the days when we still use uh, money. Uh, yeah. uh, if I was a sociopath, I might be annoyed and grab a bottle and put it over your head and try and steal your money, uh, and um, there'd be a big commotion. I'd be arrested, carted off to a police station. And then later on, when I'd sobered up, I may feel remorse. I may feel remorse. So a sociopath is someone that responds violently and impulsively to a situation antisocially. They're capable of antisocial acts, but they're very volatile, they're very impulsive, and they might feel remorse. Um, If I was, on the other hand, a psychopath and the same thing happened, um, I might not react at all. But what I might then do if I was minded to do so is wait for you outside the bar after closing, pull a knife, stick it in you, um, and take the money. So a psychopath is very cold, premeditated, you might say responsive. Uh, A sociopath is more reactive, more volatile, and more impulsive. Um, Both are capable of, obviously, of antisocial behavior. uh, But the psychopathic uh, individual, as I say, is colder and flatter and more emotionless than the sociopath. Um, Now, listen, uh, I'll tell you what we could do. I think in the last show we did, we did um, a little questionnaire, didn't we, to see uh, where the psychopath test kind of thing. Yeah, Yeah, we did something like that. Were and it went down really, really well. So what I thought we might do here, if it's all right with you, is just to kind of uh, cement this difference between sociopath and psychopath. What I'm going to do is I've got a little uh, sociopath quiz here. Okay. Uh, which you can do and which the listeners can do. Um, and what would be great, actually, I think we could get, probably get a little bit of data from this, some really interesting data, actually. All right. So if it's okay with you, what I'm going to do is ask the listeners uh, to play along at home, obviously. So get a piece of paper, get a mobile phone, because you're going to need to score some questionnaire items. Okay. Um, and when we work out your score at the end, it's only take about two minutes, when we work out your score at the end, um, post it on Twitter or social media, wherever, wherever you want to do. Uh, tag me in. So, you, you know, my Twitter handle, uh, uh, Jordan, at the real Dr. Kev, DR, Dr. Kev. <laughs> okay. Um, at the real Dr. Then, Kev. At the real Dr. Kev, DR. Because um, I am the real Dr. Kev. I'm not a fraud. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, well, there's another one out there, I'm we'll sure. We'll see about that. Uh, maybe, maybe that's who they were talking about. I don't know. Um, but anyway, and put your occupation, put your score. And also just let me know what your occupation is. I think we might have, uh, we can do a bit of real science here. We can have a look at, you know, where sociopath scores match up to to occupation. So uh, I bet most people won't want to do this. I, I think they'll, they'll do it <laughs> privately and they'll never post it. I know, like, I, I, I'm almost certain of that. So don't be surprised if you don't see a lot of responses. I don't know if I'd want to advertise, especially if I got a high score. I tell you, know what? I'll tell you what, Jordan. If I come over to the States, I'll come over to the States later on in the year. I'll bet you. I'll bet you dinner out. People do. Okay. Okay. I'll bet you. I'll bet you dinner out. People do. So we'll see anyway. Uh, but listen, folks. Here's what you're going to do. I'm going to read out eleven statements. Okay. And these statements all hypothetically describe you as a person. And what you're going to do is you're going to score each statement uh, according to a key, uh, a scoring key going from zero to three. Uh, where zero represents you strongly disagree that the statement describes you. Okay. One represents that you disagree, two agree, and uh, three strongly agree. 
Okay. okay. So zero strongly disagree, one disagree, two agree, and three strongly agree. Uh, and score them as we go along. There's 11 of them. Uh, and here we go. Number one, turning the other cheek is for wimps. Turning the other cheek is for wimps. Okay. Zero if you strongly disagree. One if you disagree, two agree, and three uh, strongly agree. Number two, okay. a lot of the time I do things that come back to bite me. A lot of the, a lot of the time uh, I do things that come back to bite me. Okay. Number three, I'm constantly shelving projects and starting new ones. I'm constantly shelving or ditching projects and starting new ones. Number okay. four, I tend to fall out with people a lot. Okay. Uh, number five, I prefer three quarters of the cake now rather than all of it later. I prefer Ooh. to have three quarters of the cake now rather than all of it later. All right. I know that probably depends what the cake is. I was going to say the cake. Yeah, I don't know, yeah, is a healthy, no, healthy had, living kind of yeah. audience, but yeah. yeah. Okay. You kind of get it. You're going to get it. Yeah. Uh, number six, I take a lot of risks irrespective of uh, personal safety or the well-being of others. Mm. Uh, number seven, uh, I often act first and deal with the consequences later. All right. I often act first and deal with the consequences later. Number eight. If you get in my way, I'm going to hurt you. All right. Get in my way and I'm going to hurt you. Number nine, I have trouble holding down a job. I have trouble holding down a job. Number 10, my relationships tend to be stormy. I've had a lot of short-term partners. And finally, number 11, I couldn't really care less about others so long as I get what I want. Okay. Okay, so folks at home, what you should have is 11 numbers on a sheet or a screen in front of you. What I want you to do is top those numbers up, up add them up, and you should come to uh, a grand total. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to read out the scoring key and what it means. Now, Jordan, let's, let's just get this out of the way. We're not diagnosing anyone here, okay? We're not diagnosing anyone. Yeah, it's pretty rudimentary, sociopath. right? It's, it's like pretty rudimentary. It gives you a rough subjective. idea of where you might be on this, let's call it the sociopath spectrum, okay? Okay. Uh, so if you scored zero to three, you are low. Zero to three, low. Four to seven, below average. Eight to 16, average. Uh, 17 to 20, above average. 21 to 24 high and 25 plus very high. There you go. So, and you can see before, I don't know, what, do you want to tell us what you got there, Jordan? Yeah, I got four. So I'm below average, below right, right average. where I and always measure up in every other area of life. So I've never right been, you've never been so happy to do, do badly on a test, have you? That's I, right. can, I can see you didn't want to do good on this one. Well, you can see, I mean, the, there's an educational value uh, to this kind of, um, sure. questionnaire uh, because i mean it really gets at the, at the difference between what a sociopath and a psychopath is so if you look at um you know um uh, constantly shelving projects and starting new ones uh, a lot of the time i come back to do this i do things that come back to bite me a lot of these things are very reactive impulse control uh, issues. impulsive control yeah antisocial predominantly whereas as i say psychopathic personality traits tend to be more uh, they include sociopathic traits, but they tend to be also have this shallow, emotionless, um, cal cool and calculated uh, facet to them as well. Uh, yeah. So that's right. uh, that's the, so. As I say, folks, listen. If you've if you've if you've got the balls, there's there's a bit of a challenge. If you've got the balls, put out your score on Twitter. No one's going to know you are, and let us know what you do for a living as well. It'd be great to see how uh, how the um, how the scores match up. I am definitely curious. I, I think if people want to go back and se uh, check out the psychopath test, that was episode 776 of this show. It was a two part episode, so it might have been 777 as well, but it's in there. It's one of, it's in one of those episodes. So people can go back and take the, take the uh, psychopath test if they are so inclined. So, all right, where does the narcissism element fit in to this whole thing? Because we've, the term narcissistic psychopath or narcissistic sociopath, it almost sounds redundant, but maybe not. Maybe not quite redundant. 
Well, you know what? Actually, Jordan, well, we got. I've got a little. If you want to do it, I've got a little narcissism test as well, just like the previous one. But let me okay. first of all, um, let me. Now, people are fascinated with after psychopaths. Narcissists are are, are 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 basically second on the list of what people seem to be fascinated by, and there is a great deal of overlap between narcissism and psychopathy. So actually, um, you know, narcissism as a personality characteristic. Um, is actually part of the psychopathic um, constellation, I suppose, as it were. Um, but there is a fundamental difference between the two, and that is that narcissists like to be the centre of attention. They like to be in the centre of that spotlight um, because that is the end product for them. They just love the attention. Uh, it's it, you know that's what they crave. They crave that kind of validation. They crave to be. Uh, the star they crave to be the person uh, at the center of things and that's what they're really after psychopaths like to be the center of attention they like to be in the spotlight because it's a means to an end that's not necessarily what they want as an end result but what they do want as an as an end result is power uh, and being the center of attention being the middle of us in uh, uh, of a spotlight on a stage gives you access to power so Narcissism is a means to an end uh, to a psychopath, whereas uh, to a narcissist, it's the end itself. So, you know, you often hear people are often confused by the fact when they hear when they talk about psychopaths, they hear, you know, well, you know, hi psychopaths are hiding in plain sight. Um, well, you know, if you are an out and out rampant narcissist, you're not going to be hiding in plain sight, are you? Uh, so narcissism is a means to an end for a psychopath sometimes. Being the centre of attention is a way that gives them access to power, whereas being just the centre of attention tends to be the be it and end all for a narcissist, if that makes sense to you. It does. Yeah, it does. Okay, so it's it's like a, it's a little garnish on the sociopath or psychopath personality trait, right? It just sort of allows them to exhibit these negative behaviour traits yeah, if we were that... building. Yeah, if we were building a psychopath, um, in the in the like the recipe, how to build a psychopath, you'd add a sprinkle of narcissism in there. Uh, so you, you're absolutely right. Um, now, listen, we can do if you want. Uh, we can do another quick uh, narcissism test, just like the sure. first one. Yeah, uh, let's see do a quick how, one. how many narcissists are out there. Um, All right. Exactly the same scoring key, folks. Just to recap: zero strongly disagree. One, disagree, two, agree, and three, strongly agree. I'm going to read you out 12 statements this time, not 11. Okay. And you're going to use that code uh, to uh, basically describe how accurate you think each statement uh, uh, describes you. And then um, top your score up at the end. Um, a couple of fun items in this uh, quiz, actually. Um, number one, I don't like it when I'm not the center of attention. I don't like it when I'm not the centre of attention. Zero strongly disagree. One disagree, two agree, and three strongly agree. Uh, number two, I love checking myself out in the mirror. I love checking myself. <laughs> I love checking myself out in the mirror. Number three, I don't like it when others around me are more the successful than me. I don't like it when others around me are more successful than me. Uh, number four. As long as I get what I want, I don't really care how other people feel. Uh, so you can see elements of psychopathy creeping into yeah. that, uh, that yeah, statement. Yeah. Uh, as long as I get what I want, I don't really care how other people feel. Uh, number five, one of my favorites. Uh, walking right up to the front of a line and jumping it doesn't phase me at all. Mm. Uh, walking right up to the front of a line and jumping it doesn't phase me at all. Uh, number six, I don't take criticism well. Uh, number seven, being totally honest, I think I'm pretty special. Number eight, I have most people I meet wrapped around my little finger. Uh, number nine, I'm a born leader. Uh, number 10, I love this one, right? If it's 50-50 for a parking space, I'm going to push right in. Now, we've all been there, Jordan. Hmm. Uh, um, number 11, when things go wrong, it's nearly always because someone has let me down. 
Um, and number 12, the final one, a lot of the time I'm the life and soul of the party. Now, of course, a lot of these things might actually be true. Um, but anyway, what you should have there, folks playing along at home, you should have 12, 12 numbers on the screen or a sheet. So just like the first time, add them up. Turn them up and we come to a grand total. And what I'm going to do now is, again, Jordan, not diagnosing anyone here as a narcissist. This is just general indication of where you All might right. be on the narcissistic spectrum. And also, can I just say that there are a lot of positive, just like psychopathic characteristics, there are a lot of positives to narcissistic traits. So, you know, sometimes you need to be uh, a little bit narcissistic uh, to get what you want in life and to be successful. Um, I've never met one top sports person that I've ever worked with who, who hasn't been high on the narcissism scale. You need to be um, have elements of narcissism to make it. So if you are scoring relatively high on this test, it's not necessarily anything to worry about. Okay, yeah, so, it's like you can uh, see the paper I'm writing on right now, and that's why you said that. But okay, fine. Uh, well, I, <laughs> let's I go over the let, scoring. We're, we're, <laughs> okay, let's go. Let, with, with, let's move quickly on. Right. Uh, right, zero to twelve. Zero to twelve is low. Zero to twelve, oh. low on the narcissism spectrum. All right. Thirteen to eighteen is below average. Nineteen to twenty-four, average. Twenty-five to thirty, high. And thirty-one to thirty-six, thirty-six maximum score, very high. Yeah. Go on. What'd you get, Jordan? 11. So that's still low. 11. Well, you're still low. Oh, I'm surprised. Crazy. I was like, oh, such these are adding up pretty fast over here a, on my yes, end. Yes, you're such a nice guy. I'll tell you what, though. When you meet, and, and I'm sure you'll know, when you meet an out-and-out -out narcissist, you really know it. Um, I mean, m most of us are kind of low to average. We've got sprinklings of it. When you meet an out-and-out -out narcissist, you, you, you really know it because there is absolutely nothing they do that doesn't focus on themselves. Every, every aspect, every topic of conversation is steered towards them. Um, they will often go into, if you go out for dinner with them, they will often you know, belittle the waiter or waitresses. Um, they will make jokes, which a lot of people don't really find funny. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff like that going on. So if you're with an out and out narcissist, you, you're kind of, and also actually another interesting fact about narcissists is when you, when you, when you're with them, uh, they'll always push through the door first. If you're going through a door, uh, they'll very rarely step back and let you go first. They'll always go through first. It's a kind of, kind of a little, little narcissism hack or a quirk. Uh, but huh. of course, you know, if people are going through doors first, that doesn't mean to say they're a narcissist, of course. But, uh, yeah, I was um, going to say, yeah. that seems like, what if they're trying to manipulate you? They might let you go in first. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, in which case, they might be a psychopath. Uh, no, <laughs> there's nothing. Sure. Forget the door thing. Forget where people start reading into that. But it's just. Yeah, little, yeah. That's uh, one of those where it's going to be like, my boyfriend always, let, you know, lets me go into the door. Is he a psychopath? But then yesterday, he let me go in first. Is he a narcissist? Yeah, no, yes, no, no. Abs, both. Abs, Break abs, up now. Well, he, and, he, and he might well be. He might well. He be, might but, be. Uh, we don't, not because we don't, of that. We don't want to start. We don't want to start worrying people. But um, yeah, so there you go. So we cleared two things up. There's the difference between kind of sociopath and a psychopath, and also kind of how narcissism fits in as well. Uh, which, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of people get confused with that. So uh, really great, we got that out of the way, actually. Thanks for watching on YouTube. Remember, you can also enjoy The Jordan Harbinger Show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Our podcast feed is a treasure trove of insights from intellectuals, authors, spies, artists, athletes, pioneers, engineers, former mafia bosses, and business leaders, all sharing their secrets to success. For more information, click the link in the description. Now, back to the show. Why do you think people are so fascinated by psychopaths? I mean, the episodes I do about psychopathy are always popular. It's, and we're not even talking about murders and true crime. You know, it's not just that it's more exciting because it's about true crime. I'm literally just talking about psychopathy. It's almost like when I do episodes about depression, nobody's like, wow, that was amazing. You know, it's like, it's just a completely different animal. Why is yeah. it, do you have any idea why this might be the case? Is it the danger element that sort of underlies the idea that these people exist and walk among us? What is it? I've done a lot of thinking, a lot of head scratching about this, Jordan. And you know what? Um, I think it's more complex than people uh, might initially think. Um, you know, I think there's three or four answers to it. Uh, I'll give you the first one that comes to mind. A few years ago, I did a, a little experiment. 
uh, where I basically said to people, here's a thought experiment. Imagine for the next three hours or so, you can do anything you want, right? Anything you want. And there will be no legal or moral or emotional repercussions or hangovers. You can just do what you want. And at the end of that, the slate will be wiped clean. But you will have got whatever it is you wanted to do off your chest. Um, and it's really interesting. So broadly speaking, people kind of fit into two camps. It's either the love camp or the hate camp. So the hate camp, the hate camp tends to be, you know what, I'd go back to that bastard and I'd show him what he, that guy who done me down a few years ago, I'd go back and teach him a lesson or two, right? That's the hate camp. And then the love camp is opposite. It's very interesting. Love camp is kind of like, you know, there's this person who I always fancied or always loved and I never told them and I'd go back and I'd tell them and, you know, it's kind of unrequited love kind of thing. So you've got either the love camp or the hate camp. Now, that's kind of interesting in itself. But what I think is really interesting is the fact that, you know, life is pretty much like that for psychopaths. Um, they have no sense of consequence. They have no anxiety over being outside their comfort zone. Um, they don't fear rejection. They don't fear repercussions. They live very much in the moment. They kind of just go for it. And so in a sense, what I'd almost been constructing there with that little thought experiment, although I didn't do it for that reason, is a, a kind of a template for what it's like to be a psychopath. Uh, you know, psychopaths don't have these general fears that we do. So they are much more, I suppose, if you want to call it existentially free. They can do this stuff with kind of emotional, legal, moral impunity. And I think... Jordan, I'm not right. This is just speculation. I think that we kind of secretly envy psychopaths that existential freedom. Um, I think that all of us would love to be able to do things that, you know, get us outside our comfort zones uh, with ease. But actually, we we can't do it. We're held back by all kinds of um, by fears and anxieties and, and and senses of repercussions and consequences. Quite rightly, in a lot of cases. But I think the first reason that we are fascinated by psychopaths is because I think we we kind of envy them their existential freedom in a sense. Now, of course, that existential freedom also enables them to um, commit some pretty abominable acts. Um, and I always use a bit of analogy of a sports car. You know, it's all right having a, a really, really fast Lamborghini or Ferrari, um, but you've got to be able to use the brakes every now and again. Um, it's no good having a car like that if you don't know how to use the brakes and your foot's always on the gas. So that's a little bit like having a psychopathic person. If you're driving a psychopathic personality car, you need to be able to use the brakes. And that's one of the differences between, you know, a good psychopath and a bad psychopath. Uh, but I think that ability to drive very fast in, 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 in a car down a twisty mountain road with the wind going through your hair, I think is something that, you know, we, we, we envy um, uh, <laughs> in psychopaths. I think we'd all love to do it. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're fascinated. Um, I think the second reason is, is the wow factor. Um, I think the, uh, you know, the Jekyll and Hyde personality is catnip to a lot of people. Uh, you know, Ted Bundy, an intelligent, attractive, handsome kind of guy, excellent self-presentation skills, but behind the scenes there was this depraved personality uh, going on. Uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, the same, you know. So I think we're also fascinated by what I call the principle of incongruity in the sense that actually what appears really, really normal on the surface uh, actually conceals something which is really kind of very different behind the scenes. And I think we've always... The human condition has always been fascinated. Human psychology has always been fascinated by contrasts. And that incongruity principle, um, I think, also taps into our fascination. I think you rightly put your finger on it, uh, you know, in your, in, in your own speculations there. I think also there's this idea of danger. Uh, we love to be scared, uh, but we love to be scared safely. Um, that's why we like roller coasters. If roller, I mean, if roller coasters weren't fastened on to the rails, we'd know yeah, get yeah. on them. Right? If people kept but, flying off of them, I don't know how many. I'd want no to try. one, exactly. No one would get on them. No one would jump out of a plane uh, without a parachute, right? Parachuting is actually a very safe sport, but jumping out of a plane, nevertheless, is still pretty scary. 
no one would jump out of a plane in their right mind without a parachute. So we love to be scared, but we love to be scared safely. That's why we swim with sharks in cages. You know, if we took the bars off the cage and all of a sudden there's nothing between us and the sharks, it'd be a different story altogether. So we like to be able to contain danger, uh, but at the same time uh, expose ourselves to it. And I think that is also one of our fascinations, especially with scary movies and horror movies. We love to sit in a cinema uh, in the safety of like the chair and, and watch kind of these kind of uh, villains and, and serial killers uh, on screen because actually we're kind of safe in that in that zone of a, of a theatre. Um, and I think that's that kind of fear factor, but controlled fear factor as well, uh, is very interesting. You know, there was some... Um, there's a, a, a very interesting study which looks at advertising placement in films. Um, and uh, if you look at uh, adverts that work very well in scary uh, horror movies, it's ads that basically appeal to what we call social proof. So the choice of millions. Those kinds of ad slogans really worked if they're placed within horror movies because, of course, when we're scared, we like to cling closer to the group. Uh, and oh, actually, interesting. You, know, you get it? So, you know, adverts that yeah. kind of, you know, promote products that a lot of people use, choice of millions, are going to go down really well in scary movies. The opposite works in romantic movies. If you go to a romantic movie on a date, you want to kind of enhance your USP, your unique selling point. So... Ads that then apply, uh, appeal to the scarcity principle, you know. So uh, you know, you, this getting this product can make you somehow unique. That works very well in in um, in romantic movies. So this kind of huh. safety, kind of danger stuff, and being scared safe um, isn't lost on people who work in the advertising industry either. So when you look at different kinds of films, the ads that's placed in them, uh, there's a lot more thought gone into that than you might than you might think. I had no idea that there was anything having to do with context in advertising. That might sound a little naive, but I really thought they just made commercials and they played them and then they changed it up when they got old. I didn't think they were like, oh, this is going to play on primetime movies on this channel that are rom-coms or that are kind of scary. And then this other version of a different commercial for the same product is going to play during the daytime when people are watching Jerry Springer, talk shows, whatever. Yeah. No, no idea. There's a, there's a lot of science goes into advertising huh. placement. Um, huh. So yeah. Uh, the other, the other really interesting thing is there's, um, there's a, a thing, a phenomenon called murderabilia. Uh, which is really interesting. Murderabilia? Kind of murderabilia. So it's like memor serial killer memorabilia, right? That's what I was going to guess. Yeah, like yeah, here's the actual bloody, I don't yeah. know, whatever from well, this crime scene. Well, absolutely. And there's 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 internet sites which sell this stuff. So, you know, everything That's from a creepy. locker. Yeah, well, everything from a locker, Charlie Manson's hair. Uh, I think Ted Bundy's Volkswagen Beetle went up for sale. Um, oh, man. John That's... Wayne... Gacy, Dark. I mean, can you imagine picking someone up, going out for a date and picking them up? And, hey, what, a, what an opening line. This is Ted Bundy's Volkswagen. Hey, people. you know who used to own uh, this car? The guy who used <laughs> yeah. to murder women he used to pick up with on dates. Exactly, yeah. I mean, I guess he's going home alone. But um, John Wayne Gacy, paintings by John Wayne Gacy, Pogo the Clown, um, that he used to um, pose as at children's parties, uh, paint John Wayne Gacy paintings. Dorothy Puente. Uh, who was a killer landlady in her 70s, uh, late 60s and 70s, killed um, all her uh, tenants, uh, claimed their pensions, and she then buried them in the backyard of the, uh, the boarding house. Uh, if you want a lump of dirt, uh, a, a little bag of dirt from her back garden, uh, I think that retails about $25 on some sites. So if, like, Bundy's Volkswagen Beetle is a bit too, bit too expensive... Uh, you can get a bag of dirt from Dorothy Puente's uh, back garden. So murderabilia is, is is like a fascinating. When people say to me, well, why are we fascinated by psychopaths and serial killers? Murderabilia is a really interesting kind of phenomenon. Um, and it's really interesting. What's, go what's, what's going on with murderabilia? There seems to be two things. It's, in psychology, it's known as the, what's called the talisman effect. And it's almost like if you possess something which was owned by a serial killer you somehow retain their essence and it has a kind of a protective quality about about it you forget murderabilia this is the kind of psychology that works behind celebrity auctions in general 
So Kurt Cobain's manky old sweater that he that he um, that he wore on the famous MTV uh, performance. Um, you know, I mean, actually in itself, it's probably worth nothing. The fact it was worn by Kurt Cobain on that iconic appearance. Uh, means it Im- it's imbued with some kind of essence of Kurt Cobain, or at least we think, and that's why it retails. I think it went for f- something like fifty thousand dollars or something like that. So, within so- that, we're talking about stuff which is right on the borders between psychology and philosophy here. Uh, a topic called essentialism, and that is that um, that the articles or items that are um, uh, once owned by uh, people retain a kind of an essence or a sense of who they are. And this is the psychology behind memor- uh, uh, murderabilia. So if we if we possess an item that was uh, somehow um, uh, owned or, or by a serial killer or, or, or pr- produced by a serial killer, um, like in Gacy's paintings, we somehow retain an essence of them. And that that's almost like a protective talisman. Similar thing with uh, a few years ago in the States, they used to have serial killer trading cards. Um, and this kind of was very controversial. Serial killer but, trading cards. Trading cards, yeah, like little cigarette <sighs> cards. People could kind of, uh, kind of swap and, and 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 kind of collect. And this proved very controversial. It was about ten years ago, I think. Uh, people were saying, well, this is kind of glamorizing serial killers and crime, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But actually, when people started digging into what was going on here, um, it was complete opposite. People that were collecting these kind of serial killer trading cards. Um, we're actually getting a lot of anxiety reduction by the idea of like having these serial killers nicely lined up in cornrows in a box, <laughs> which they could put the lid on. So I know it's completely okay. counterintuitive. That it goes is against weird. Common sense. Yeah, it's like it a kind of, yeah. Jewish person collecting Nazi memorabilia or something like that. It's literally to put it in a box, put the lid on it. You know, this kind of prevents you from maybe you know inoculates you against you know real world danger and, and, and what have you. Um, so I think the answer, very long-winded answer to your question, I think the reason we're fascinated by psychopaths runs very deep and is complex. I think, you know, another really interesting angle, which we probably don't have time to talk about now, is why why people befriend serial killers, sometimes marry them. I was just going to uh, bring this topic up. It reminds yeah. me of, and I just looked it up while you were talking, I think it's called hybristophilia Ooh. or hybristophilia. I don't know exactly well, how you pronounce it. I, 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 yeah, absolutely. I didn't know the, about? Um, yeah, it is. Well, I'll take your word for it. I didn't know. <laughs> I yeah. didn't actually know the, uh, the scientific term, but, um, that's it's all right. Really You're just a PhD having to do with this exact topic. Uh, I don't expect you to know I'm these a, things. I'm a fraud. I'm, I'm a fraud. Like you <laughs> After say, all, you, you are caught me out. Yeah, fraudulent they... Dr. Kev. Yeah, it's That's called right. hyperstophilia, and it has to do with the people that write to, or, or in part, people that write to people in prison who are murderers and, like, send them locks of hair and money and write them letters. And it's they usually have a traumatic past and because people are saying, what's going on here? And there's theories like maybe the person was victimized. And so they feel like if they're dating or or in love with or friends with a serial killer, they have that person's protection somehow, even though I would imagine statistically they're just more likely to get killed by that person uh, unless the person's in prison, in which case they they sort of have their foot in both worlds, right? They're friends with the serial killer, but the serial serial killers behind bars and they know that they're there because they just got a letter for them from them last week in a response to their letter that they sent the week before. I think you pretty much nailed it. Um, again, there's that kind of preventative, protective talisman effect going on there, uh, which you've, uh, which you just put your finger on, Jordan. I think also um, it's slightly more complex than that. There's kind of um, uh, a number of reasons, psychological reasons, why people befriend serial killers. I think uh, low self-esteem is one of them. Uh, so studies have looked at um, uh, you know kinds of people that do befriend serial killers. Low self-esteem seems to be a common factor. Um, and it's almost like, you know, your self-esteem is getting a little kind of push up the ladder, uh, goes up a few rungs by um, seemingly getting the attention of someone who has control, as it were, over life and death. So self-esteem is a factor. Um, funnily enough, narcissism also comes into the equation. Um, in a way, it is a bit more ghoulish than the self-esteem. So some people think that, like, by getting close to serial killers, 
uh, they can somehow get a little bit more information about the crime that other people might not have. So they're part of that serial killer's, killer's inner circle. They might be a confidant that serial killers might confide in. Um, and of course, that's not, you know, serial killers are often very manipulative and, you know, that, that's something which, uh, which, they, uh, which isn't lost on them. So, so self-esteem is one thing. Narcissism is another. And uh, absolutely, you just put your finger on it, um, anxiety issues as well. So uh, it's almost like, you know, if you are at the eye of the storm, if you're at the eye of the hurricane, um, it can't, you know, that's the safest place to be. So it can't harm you. So if you're up close and personal with a serial killer, um, you know, that you're, you're, you're not you're not going to be uh, you're not going to be harmed in any way. Um, of course, you know, that's like people that kiss crocodiles. Um, sometimes it's the very last thing you do. So, um, uh, yeah, ab absolutely. So I think generally speaking, when you talk to people and say, oh, you know, we're fascinated by psychopaths, that's because of X and Y. It's actually a lot more complex. There's a lot of psychology behind our fascination with, uh, with psychopaths and serial killers. It says a lot about us. Yeah, I, I would say so. What about kids? Obviously, kids can be psychopaths because, well, we've seen some horrific things done by children, but, and if it's a brain, if it's a brain makeup type of thing, then it would be present in children. But how does it manifest in children? You don't see serial killer kids. At least, I'm sure there's examples, but it, there's, it's probably extremely rare. How does psychopathy manifest in, in kids or does it? Yeah. Kids is psychopathy and kids is uh, a really interesting topic, Jordan. Um, the first thing that you've got to bear in mind, is that actually you're not allowed to call a child a psychopath. Well, certainly here in the UK anyway. Okay. Because of the kind of the pejorative um, kind of sense of that label. Um, instead, believe it or not, you have to refer to uh, them as callous and unemotional. Okay. So, I mean, which I think is a little bit Monty Python. I mean, if I was a parent and I went into a clinician's consulting room and I was worried about my kids' behavior and the clinical psychologist or psychiatrist said to me, um, well, I think your child has got callous and unemotional traits. I think I'd be more pissed off than if they said your kid's a psychopath. Sure. Um, so I, I, think, I think this idea of like swapping, you know, callous and unemotional traits for psychopathy um, is an interesting debate in itself. Uh, so the first thing is you can't really call kids psychopaths. The second thing is there's no silver bullet test. Um, to say, yeah, this kid is a, is, a, is a psychopath. In a sense, there's no silver bullet test for adults like that either. You know, even if you look at brain patterns, um, yeah, there's some kind of patterns which are similar, uh, but not identical, and they don't hold true across all people who are psychopathic. So there's general trends, but there's no silver bullet test um, to say, yes, kid is a psychopath. However, as you rightly point out, there are quite a few examples of kids that have committed crimes which actually mirror the kinds of crime that an adult psychopath would commit. I think there was a case in the States a few years ago of a nine-year-old boy that pushed a three-year-old toddler into a swimming pool and, and literally just sat and watched the child drown, uh, oh my God. almost in a scientific kind of detached way to see what would happen and then calmly walked off. Um, and when they were arrested later on, they showed absolutely... Uh, no remorse, no fear of the consequences, and in fact, rather like being the centre of attention. Um, so, you know, there's certain you know, you know, horrible cases of kids acting in, in what looks very much like a psychopathic way. Um, now, it's interesting that studies have been done which have looked at differences in kids at formative stages of their development and whether that predicts whether they will eventually grow up to be... Um, adult psychopaths. And there is evidence to suggest that it does. So kids as, as young as one year old, 12 month old children, uh, babies, uh, there was one study which um, attached uh, little electrodes to the soles of the baby's feet to measure uh, sweat, galvanic, galvanic skin response, which is basically how much they sweat, which is an index of anxiety and fear. When they were confronted with a scary robot, that made very loud noises and had flashing lights and all this kind of stuff. Um, what the researchers found was that those 12-month-old uh, babies that showed uh, less sweat response um, to that scary robot um, were more likely to go on and develop psychopathy 
uh, in adulthood than kids huh. who showed the normal sweat response. So fear and anxiety to that to that robot. So, you know, differences can show up uh, as young as 12 months old. Now, moving forward, uh, looking at adolescence, I think the age bracket that this particular study looked at was 11 to 16. They had three groups of adolescents. Uh, they had uh, a control group, which is what you might call neurotypical kids. Uh, you then had a group which were antisocial kids. And then you had a third group, which was antisocial kids with psychopathic tendencies. Uh, and what the researchers did, they played uh, canned laughter, recorded laughter to each of these groups, and they looked at which of the kids would be more likely to laugh back, laugh along. It's a natural response if you hear other people laughing. It's how comedy sitcoms work. Obviously, back in the day, you'd play a load of canned laughter to a live audience, and it would make the audience more likely to laugh along. Uh, and what they found was extraordinary. Um, the neurotypical kids laughed along uh, with the canned laughter, with the, with the recorded laughter. Uh, the antisocial kids laughed along to the uh, recorded laughter. It was only the antisocial adolescents with psychopathic tendencies that didn't. Um, and this was mirrored in uh, their brains. When you looked at what was going on in their brains, the premotor and motor areas of the brain, uh, which prepare you to laugh and then get you to laugh, uh, there was much less activity in the brains of those antisocial kids with psychopathic tendencies um, than there was in the other two groups. Uh, so, you know, there are um, certainly predispositions in, in the way brains work in uh, kids as young as 12 months, also in adolescents aged 11 to 16. So there's enough evidence to suggest that there's something going on here. Um, I think at the other, the other side of the coin, Jordan, is I think that although I do believe that um, you know, you, you, psychopathy in, is present. Personally, I do believe psychopathy is present in, in, um, in the younger age group. We need to be careful that we don't medicalize behavior that is actually normal at those ages. Because right, what you've got to remember like I, is... I was thinking about that same thing. I didn't want to interrupt yeah. you, but I was like, my God, if they medicalize me... when I, I yeah. look back at my childhood and I think... I would absolutely have been the kid where they're like, that guy's going to shoot up the school. He's crazy because I was a punk. I got in trouble. I was always on the Internet looking at stuff. And this is in the early days when nobody had Internet. I help people do kind of bad stuff. Not like I'm not talking about, you know, lighting cats on fire. I'm talking about like doing something to a local person's store. Not like not even anything really bad looking back, but just crappy teenager stuff. And but also being lonely and quiet and brooding and dark. And I'm thinking, man, if they pathologized me back then, I would have been in the the school with the police at, guard at the door. You know, it was just so I can imagine it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you say these are the bad kids, these are the psychopaths, a kid who's just having a couple bad couple of years because of hormones and parenting and grades, it might end up in a, in a much worse situation than they would be if we just let them get over their shit. Absolutely right. And I think that's that's the key that you just said there. I mean, you know, when you look at kids and, and you start saying, OK, well, you know, this kid might be a psychopath because they've done X, Y and Z, um, you know, kids' brains are still developing. Um, so when we diagnose adult psychopaths, you know, the brains of, of like, you know, they, they, they're fully developed and they, they kind of, you know, OK, that's that's the end of that development. But, you know, kids... And this is where we've got to be really careful in medicalizing uh, behaviors in kids. You know, the, the brains are still in a developmental stage. So if you take stuff like, you know, risk taking, sensation uh, seeking, you know, even in younger kids, just being mean, telling lies. These are kind of just normal behaviors that actually we need to be very careful not to medicalize them. So I think we've got to look at both sides. But I think also I think, you know, there's a bit of common sense here. Uh, you know, when you meet kids, there's, 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 there's a difference in, in, you know, as you said, someone who's, who's um, you know, lighting, setting cats on fire, torturing animals um, and doing kind of stuff like that. All kids are naughty. All kids are risk takers. All kids are impulsive and do mean things. We've got to be really careful that we don't medicalize normal behavior uh, too quickly. On the other hand, though, 
Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that psychopathy does man- manifest itself at, at a formative age as well. How old do you think we? How old do you think that age is? You know, little there, because I've seen little kids do stuff like like my son wanted to squash a butterfly or something like that, and I was like, no, that's not for squashing; it's for looking at. And I remember the exact same. My mom yelling at me when I squashed a butterfly when I was a really little kid. And she's like, don't do that. You know, you don't yeah. have to do that. They're for looking at. They're pretty. Don't squash them. But I didn't grow up to be somebody who squashes cats or 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 even bugs unless they're cockroaches, which are yeah. freaking disgusting. I don't I don't do that anymore. Yeah. And Jen was my wife was a little worried, and I was like, no, it's a boy thing. It's a kid slash boy thing to try and squash something that's alive and not think about it when they're three years old. Yeah, I mean, well, it's really interesting you said that. Well, actually, there are differences between boys and girls in terms of um, of, of, of psychopathy. You know how 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 common it is, and that's of course to do with the way kids are, are brought. One of the reasons is the way kids are brought up. Um, but it's it's interesting what you said there. The um, you know we find it. And I know what you mean, of course, but we find it very easy to squash a cockroach or a or a wasp or something like that, but not very easy to squash a butterfly. So we're okay squashing stuff that we don't like, um, but actually stuff that seems to be that we do like or is pretty, we have a problem with. At the well, end okay. of the day, we're but still extinguishing fair, life. When's the last time you got sick or got bitten or stung by a butterfly? Never. But if I if a cockroach is in my house, it's going. If a spider's there, it's going to either get le- lifted outside on a paper or squashed. You know, and a wasp, I don't even don't don't even get. You know, I'm either getting away from it, and if I can't do that, I'm going after it. That's those are the two choices, right? So I, it's a little bit different, right? It's almost like a survival thing. What was it? Sting like a butterfly, float like a bee? No, no, it was the other way around. Wasn't it? Um, yeah, but yeah. Um, yeah, I think <laughs> I think, I think it was. the. Uh, yeah, um, I, you know, at what, at what age, Jordan? It's, it really is not a cop out, this, mate. It is how long is a piece of string, really? I mean, um, it, I would, if I was going to, if, do you know what, if I was going to just come out with a non scientific answer, I'd probably say about the age of 13 or 14. Um, I'd say probably around there. Uh, but, you know, I'm sure people have, um, have, have got, uh, got other ideas, but, um, uh, I would I would say yeah about thirteen forty when you start entering your teenage years if you're still squashing butterflies at that age um, uh, maybe it's time to uh, to look in the mirror if you're a narcissist Yikes. yeah <laughs> sure sure <laughs> you'll enjoy it at that rate yeah how did we end up with psychopathy evolving as a trait. And I assume it survived because, and I think we talked about this last time we did a show, it survived because those people are useful to society. Soldiers, leaders, now surgeons, lawyers, whatever, business folks. I get why it hasn't been bred out, but how did it come about initially, do you think? I mean, do you have any evidence for it other than evolution? Yeah, I mean, if you look at, uh, I mean, game theorists have modeled um, uh, theories of, psychopathy evolution in computer simulations and they've pretty much come out with the one percent um uh scenario which is uh thought to be uh representative of psychopaths in everyday life uh, pure psychopaths that is um i would also argue though that actually you know and i've said this a lot you know people say how many how, what percent of psychopaths are out of one percent well they're only the psychopaths that we've caught um, so we don't actually know how many, what, what the true incidence of psychopaths is out there. We know, you know, how many psychopaths have been caught because they're the ones, we, a lot of these tests are conducted in prison. Uh, but actually there may be way more out there who have eluded, uh, detection, eluded capture, um, who might inflate that figure. So we, we don't know. Um, so yeah, game theorists have, have looked at like, um, uh, you know, evolution of psychopathy in computer simulations. And they've pretty much found the same kind of incidents um, as you find in everyday life. Um, one of the obvious things, Jordan, is that psychopaths are charismatic. Uh, they are promiscuous as well. They have a lot of sexual partners. Um, and so I call that the kind of James Bond profile, charismatic and promiscuous. Um, by the very definition of those characteristics, those genes are going to get out more. They're going to get around more. Uh, so, you know, there's one very simple reason why, you know, psychopathy is sticking around. 
Uh, but also if you go back to the days of our, you know, um, ancient ancestors and you look at those groups, uh, there's always going to be a need for predators. Uh, there's always going to be a need for warriors. There's always going to be a need for risk takers. Um, you know, if you just think about it, who were the, who's, who's the first person that decided to eat a pomegranate? You know, I mean, who's going to put their finger in there and eat that stuff? Actually, it turned out yeah, it's quite I, good. But I you always assume to be a they watch restaurant. animals do it first. That's all, that's yeah. the only theory I have for the, that kind I, of stuff. And I think you're probably right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but you, we we need people like that. We need boundary pushers. We need risk takers. We need warriors. We need predators because that's the kind of way in which we got here by pushing boundaries. Now, here's a really interesting um, uh, theory. Um, it's a theory which a former mentor of mine um, uh, came up with um, uh, called rivalrous cohesion. And if you look at um, what the kinds of psychological forces that make groups more cohesive and bring groups together, what you find is that one of them is if a group comes under attack uh, from an external source, the group that's under attack becomes more cohesive. It unites. I mean, very simple example, if you, you remember um, uh, uh, the United States after the 9-11 attacks, mm -hmm. um, you know, everyone became more cohesive. Society became more unified against this kind of abominable, atrocious act. So, and, you know, this has been replicated in laboratory studies, uh, internet chat rooms, for example, when members of an inter internet chat room are exposed to an outside threat. The, uh, the, 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 the vibe, the atmosphere in that internet chat room becomes more cohesive. So external threat makes groups more cohesive and also attacking uh, another group makes the attacking group more cohesive. So here's a very controversial theory. It may well be that conflict, societal conflict, evolved to keep society together, to, get, to keep groups together. We need a little bit of conflict because conflict is one of those things that actually keeps groups cohesive every now and again. Uh, and so who are the people that are most likely to stir up conflict? Who are those, who are those warriors? Who are those predators? It's people who are higher on the psychopathic spectrum. So there's a theory which you don't hear too often, that perhaps actually one of the reasons why psychopathy evolved is actually not to split society up and, and ruin it, but actually to keep it together and make it more cohesive. Hmm. That is interesting, and you're right. I have not heard that at all, and it kind of dovetails into. The, I was going to ask if there's anything such thing as a good psychopath, which is not a great question, but it sort of is answered by that exact line of thinking. And of course, there are benefits that psychopaths bring to society. So again, the surgery and the, the leadership things, regardless of the, the damage that they might do in their personal lives. Um, there's a very sort of distinct line between. And we see this all the time, right? People who have terrible, disastrous personal lives, but have done really good things for society because they are the leader of a large enterprise or a country or something like that, or they've they've invented something or they've worked really hard, even in artistic pursuits, right? How, the how cliche is that the best, most talented people in Hollywood, their lives are just an absolute disaster and they're on their fifth divorce. And they're always, you know, it's, 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 it's a cliche for a reason, I suppose. Um, I wonder, as a, as a scientist who does occasionally deal with some very, I guess, air quotes, bad people, do you believe in the evil element of it or do you look at this more clinically? You know, I have to say, uh, Jordan, that um, as a scientist, I have a problem with <clears throat> using that term evil. But it's, it's, a, word, it's a word which, uh, you know, I myself have used. Um, unashamedly to describe, um, for want of a better word, sometimes even as a scientist, you know, scientists are human beings. Uh, and sometimes you've just got to look at something and say, you know, especially if you're talking to everyday people, you know, it's just an evil act. These, these people are, uh, it's just something that's evil. Um, but let me kind of talk about it logically if I can. Um, if we start off with the premise that, um, often what you might describe as an evil act uh, is generally underpinned by a deficit in moral code, okay? Now, one of the things that we know from laboratory studies, um, scientific studies in psychology, 
is the fact that moral uh, behaviors and judgments are often underwritten by random fluctuations in the external environment over which we often have no control at all. Um, and there's a, a great area in psychology called embodied cognition, uh, which looks at this. So, for example, um, if you wash your hands, you are more likely to judge a person harshly in terms of if they've done a misdemeanor or something. So let's say you're in a um, what's called a mock jury study where you've got to give someone a sentence for some, some wrong they've done. Um, if you get two groups of people, one of which have, have washed their hands and another group of people have got dirty hands, uh, the people that have washed their hands are more likely to give stricter sentences than the people that haven't washed their hands, got dirty hands. So we've got this phrase in, in the English language, you know, I've washed my hands of you. Um, it's actually mirrored in, 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 in scientific truth. Uh, also, there's another really weird study that you're more likely, if you're, if you're, a, if you're on the street and you're asking for money, you're sitting in a, in a, in a, in a you know, you've got your basket in front of you and you want some cash uh, and you're begging for money, uh, you're more likely to get it at the top of a set of stairs than at the bottom. Um, again, studies shown it's exactly this kind of moral high ground, uh, exactly that phrase in the English language. So you're, more, you're going to be more generous at the top of the flight of stairs than you are at the bottom. Now, I know this sounds crazy, but these studies have actually been done. So if we start off with the premise that um, evil acts tend to be underpinned by a deficit in moral code, and we then look at the next line down, which looks at, you know, moral behaviours and judgments are often underwritten by random fluctuations in the environment over, under which we, you know, over which we've got no control, then, you know, calling someone evil because they do something tends to be a bit of a cop-out um, because we can see that actually there's all kinds of, you know, influences on the brain which makes us behave right or wrong over which a lot of us have got no control over. So, you know, we don't we don't act because things are happening in our elbows or our armpits. We act because something's happening in our brain. Uh, and we know that, you know, obviously the, the brain is instrumental in, in underpinning moral behavior and deficits in moral behavior are often called evil. So I think if we kind of go against that kind of logic, which I've just outlined, we invoke a kind of a dualism. Uh, which is a very dangerous path to go down, where there's kind of some kind of separation between the mind and the body. Uh, and as uh, a, as a scientist, um, I I can't do that. But um, that's the logical answer. Uh, the that's you know answering with my head, answering with my heart. Yeah, sometimes I have looked at people and I've said, yep, yeah, they're just pure evil. It's 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 a word that exists. Um, which, which, yeah, does which I have used, and which does describe some people who who I've uh, who I've dealt with. Um, it's really interesting, actually, going back to you know the good psychopath um, uh, question. Um, it all goes back to those, you know, if we go back to the mixing desk style, uh, you know, you've got ruthlessness, fearlessness, no conscience, no empathy, and they're all those kind of knobs and sliders on the mixing desk dial. Um, I think the key here, the difference between a good and a bad psychopath is, is how you dial those up. It's to do with, it's exactly like mixing a soundtrack in a studio, right? Uh, it depends on the context in which you dial those characteristics up. It depends on the combination in which you dial those traits up. It depends on the level. And it also depends on the intention uh, that you're going to use them for. So um, if you are, if you've got like ruthlessness, fearlessness, no conscience, no empathy, all turned up to max and it's stuck there, <clears throat> you're likely going to be a bad psychopath. However, if you can kind of twiddle those dials in various combinations, depending on the circumstances that you might happen to find yourself in, then you're going to be what, what I call a, a good psychopath. Here's something I, I thought you might be interested in, actually. Sure. Um, there was... Um, there was a guy who I once dealt with, uh, or people often ask me whether, you know, Hannibal Lecter actually exists, you know, these kinds of genius mm -hmm. psychopaths. Uh, they don't, um, although, uh, you know, I have met psychopaths uh, with very high IQs, and I'm going to tell you about one right now. 
Uh, but generally speaking, intelligence within uh, the psychopath population is exactly the same as intelligence within the general population. You've got really stupid psychopaths and you've got highly intelligent psychopaths. Um, but here's, um, here's an interesting moral dilemma, which I gave a psychopath who'd done some uh, pretty horrible things, um, uh, which, I, which I can't go into. But he had an IQ of 160. He was a guy uh, in his mid-20s. Uh, he was in a secure unit. Um, and I read him out. I was very interested uh, to see what his response would be. I read him out um, a moral dilemma. I'm going to read it to you now by the okay. British uh, moral philosopher Philippa Foote. Um, and it uh, goes back to the uh, our discussion about medicine, actually. Uh, and the moral dilemma is this. What I'm going to do, I'll read the moral dilemma out, and then I'm going to read out the response of this guy who is a, a psychopath uh, with an IQ of 160, very high, Dilemma goes like this. Brilliant transplant surgeon has five patients. Each of the patients is in need of a different organ and each of them will die without that organ. Unfortunately, there are no organs currently available to perform any of the transplants. A healthy young traveler just passing through comes into the doctor's surgery for a routine checkup. While performing the checkup, the doctor discovers that his organs are compatible with all five of his dying patients, right? Suppose further that were the young man to disappear, no one would suspect the doctor. Would the doctor be right to kill the young man to save his five patients? So this is very similar to another moral dilemma called the trolley problem, which will be familiar right. To a lot of your listeners, Jordan, um, uh, and in fact, uh, it's by the same moral philosopher, Philip of Foot. So it's a variation on this. Um, now, obviously, what we're looking at here is we're looking at all kinds of dichotomies here. There's problems with these dilemmas, uh, of course, but we're looking at dichotomies here between emotion and non-emotion, utilitarianism, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, most people would say, well, no, uh, it's not right for the doctor to kill the patient. Um, uh, however, here's what, uh, the psychopath who I was telling you about a young guy with an IQ of 160 said, uh, his exact words were, I can see where the problem lies. If all you're doing is simply playing the numbers game, it's a no brainer, isn't it? You kill the guy and save the other five. It's utilitarianism on crack. The trick's not to think about it too much. If I was the doctor, I wouldn't give it a second thought. It's five for the price of one, isn't it? Five bits of good news. I mean, and here's where it gets manipulative, right? I mean, what about the families of these guys against one piece of bad? That's got to be a bargain, hasn't it? So uh, that is the uh, verdict of a high IQ, IQ 160. Um, that's probably top half a percent in terms of IQ of, uh, of a pure psychopath. Um, so I'll leave it up to your listeners, uh, to, uh, to kind of work out whether there is, uh, whether he's onto something there or not, but it's certainly food for thought, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, uh, of course that's the difference, right? That illustrates it really well because that's most people listening would never kill some innocent guy to save other people because they know that it's wrong. This guy's just able to go, yeah, I'm saving five people for one guy that nobody's going to miss what's he, he, like he's completely not hung up on it at all he exactly. didn't even just blind the numbers game yeah he didn't seem to hesitate it was just like immediate immediate and obvious answer to him yeah. which is must be really nice because you can just view the world in this very obviously easy way that other the rest of us don't don't do yeah exactly and and there are times Jordan, where actually that kind of thinking is genuinely going to save lives, could even save the planet. But in the great vast majority of cases, it's going to land you in a lot of trouble. And I think that's that's the real paradox. That's the dilemma that we face with psychopaths. Um, so, yeah, good psychopaths do exist, um, but um, it all depends on those dials. They've got to be dialed up in the right uh, in, in the in the right combinations, in the right context, used in the for the right intentions and dialed up at the right levels. And you've got to be able to dial them back down again as well. Kev, thank you very much for coming back on the show. I really appreciate it. The psychop again, the psychopath stuff, 
always, always, always so interesting. And uh, I'm sure there's more we can talk about. And I think there's a lot of people right now who are probably wanting to rewind and retake those tests because their scores were a little high. And I'm curious, I'm curious what those folks end up posting on social or if they just email it to me privately and don't want to be public. I don't know if I would, if the results were really high, I don't know if I would have shared with you. I might've been like, oh, I'll take it later. Well, but, uh, listen, God, if, you did, if you do, if you do, if you want to take a risk, I suppose it all depends on like, in a sense, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, isn't it, George? Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're high on the risk-taking spectrum, you're going to put it out. But again, it's all, it's all pretty anonymous, isn't it, in, in a lot of cases. But folks, if you, if you do uh, feel minded to put it out, do put it out because and, and say what your occupation is and tag me in. So, Jordan, you got, you got my Twitter handle. Tag me in on, on when you put it out on social media, at the real Dr. Kev, D-R-K-V. Um, tag me in because I'd love to see how your occupation matches up to your scores um, on those particular tests, especially at the extreme ends. Uh, be a, be a, a great bit of scientific data to uh, to get hold of. And uh, maybe at some future point, Jordan, uh, I'll come, I'm meant to be coming out of the States later on this year, mate. We can uh, we can have a chat about that and um, I'll put a, a few few graphs together and we can have a look at it. Perfect. Sounds good to me. Thank you so much. All right, Jordan. Thanks very much, mate. Thanks for checking out this entire episode of The Jordan Harbinger Show. If you're interested in exploring this topic further, check out The Jordan Harbinger Show podcast feed. There, we dive even deeper on this and many other topics. In the audio podcast, I also close open loops, cover things discussed off camera, off air, and give some parting lessons from our guest. You can find The Jordan Harbinger Show in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, any podcast app, or at jordanharbinger.com. And also, if you found this episode useful, please share it with those you care about. Last but not least, like, comment, and subscribe.